evening, folks, and welcome to the Langley Adams Library in Groveland. Nice to have you here. Nice that we're finally getting some decent weather. Hope you will stay with us. Tonight we have Christopher Daly with us. Uh, we're going to learn about Lincoln's assassination, which happened about 150 years ago. Um, I wanted to also mention a couple of the upcoming events we'll be having. One big one is the book sale, which will be April 24th, 25th, and 26th. The 24th, they have it at night. Um, there's a fee of $10 um, to do that. It's from 6 to 9 at night. Um, on the 25th, there will be tons of things going on. Um, it has the book sale, the bake sale, silent auction. There will be a fife and drum from 11 to 12 that day with... Uh, David Vos and Sue Walco um, doing patriotic songs because uh, just a few days earlier was pa <coughs> Patriots Day. Um, Sweet Paw Rescue and the Great Dog Rescue will be there if anyone wants to adopt a dog or puppy. Uh, there will be a bouncy house if you're feeling energetic. Um, some cotton candy, popcorn, I'm sure there's something else. Um, and that Sunday, the 26th, there'll be the bag sale, and I believe that's from 9 to 12. And then, um, feel free to come on up. Um, on the 27th, we'll be having Neil Sanders, he's a mystery writer. He is actually going to be talking about um, gardening is murder. It's one of his talks that he puts on, and it's actually... Um, point of view of the husband. Um, so it should be a fun talk. But tonight we have Christopher Daly who has many different talks and so hopefully we'll get to have him back for another talk which we think, think about for next year. Okay. Irish need not apply. I guess this is my audition. Yes, okay. yes. <laughs> yes. Play to the audience. Okay. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me in Groveland. It's uh, such a pleasure to be out here. You have a beautiful town. I'm from way down on Cape Cod, down by uh, Buzzards Bay there. And uh, it was good coming through Boston. There wasn't too much traffic today. Come on in. Excuse me, sir. Now, uh, the Lincoln assassination is one of about eight lectures I've, I do. I'm a history teacher normally. And uh, I've been doing these lectures for about 20 years. But this one in particular is something, this is a topic that I've loved since I was in grade school. Since I began to read. I, the, one of the first books I opened was Bruce Catton's Civil War, the big giant picture book. And I was just enthralled with it. I, I get this sense that, uh, even as a young kid, that this was uh, a critical time in our history that... Uh, and if it had gone the other way, we might not be what we are today. We could have been two countries. We could have been three, four, five. We could have been balkanized. By this time, who knows? We could have been, you know, like the Balkans, as I say. Mm. And as I got to study more and more, I keyed in on the Lincoln assassination. And I, I've got this weird theory. It's uh, basically, I think that Lincoln was put here for one reason. And that was to keep this country together. And by that I mean, isn't it strange how we go through this horrendous war, all these people are dead, and then the war ends and he is plucked out of this world, almost like the hand of fate was moving. And uh, there's instances in U.S. history where I see that hand of fate. One other little omenish thing is <coughs> when uh, John Adams and uh, Thomas Jefferson died. Same day. Same, Same day, days. and it was the 4th of July. And a lot of people don't know that um, Madison also died on the 4th of July. It's like a little, you know, omen, you know, saying. And I think uh, what happened with Lincoln was like that, too. And it's always, I've had that feel about the Civil War and this thing. So uh, I've investigated it for years. I've traveled. I've been to every little site that has to do with this. I've stood on the site where John Wilkes Booth was shot, where Lincoln was shot, where the executions happened, everything. In fact, um, when my wife and I were getting ready to get married, she's over here, I think, still. So, uh, she said, where do you want to go on the honeymoon? Jokingly, I said, Gettysburg. 
And she went, that's a great idea. <laughs> and I was like, I know I got the right woman here. Yeah. <laughs> and we went from Gettysburg down to Washington, D.C. and all over. So essentially, some of these pictures are honeymoon pictures. So. Uh, others, we've been down there time and time again, are other pictures and videos. So without any more jibber-jabber, let's get going. And I'll shut this off here. Welcome back. And uh, it's my pleasure to share this with you. This is a passion of mine, and I hope you enjoy it, too. Uh, before we get going, if you have any questions or comments, uh, we'll try to have a little question and answer period at the end of this. I think uh, there's going to be a lot of things that you didn't know about, and you might have some questions. All right. Before we start, let's look at two points of view here. That's one point of view. Here's another point of view. And if you want to talk about the Lincoln assassination, you cannot talk about it without at least talking somewhat about the Civil War. This, this war was the bloodiest in our history. Um, some of the battles fought in this war, there were more dead than Vietnam, more than Korea. <coughs> Look at these. <coughs> these figures here. That's just Union alone, 360,000 and the Confederates. That's over half a million. That's 618,000 Americans dead. And I don't think today we can even grasp that. Uh, when you look at this, look at these. Gettysburg was the biggest military conflict in the Western Hemisphere. And when you add all the casualties, both North and South, both American, 50,000 people dead in three days. Shocking. And this was also the first war to be photographed. People saw the graphic nature of this. They saw what battle was like. In the olden days, you might read about it in the paper and not really get it. People got it here. And they saw the coffins coming home day after day after day. Many people don't know this, but the South was winning in the beginning of the war. And Lincoln was roundly detested. He was not popular because of the massive carnage, but he stuck to his guns. He, looked, he was looking for generals that could fight, that were willing to win battles and not play tactical games. Look at these. And a lot of people don't realize this either. Uh, back during the Civil War, if you joined the army, uh, your whole regiment was made up of, of fellas from your town. So if you were in a battle with, uh, like Gettysburg and your whole regiment got wiped out, there were no men coming back to your town. There were places where it was all women and children. Nothing left. <clears throat> and I was just talking to a gentleman today. Uh, although there were a lot of uh, bullet injuries, uh, shrapnel, whatnot, a lot of these deaths were not just battlefield deaths. A lot of these deaths were just from dysentery, from typhoid, from the tuberculosis, the consumption they called it back then. And uh, the, the state of medicine back then was atrocious. Uh, we take it for granted today, antibiotics. Mm -hmm. That wouldn't be for another uh, nearly 100 years almost. I think it was in the 40s they discovered uh, penicillin, 30s or 40s. And uh, look at this. When they operated, these doctors would saw one leg off with the same saw, throw the leg in a pile, and then take the same saw and just continue. It was like an assembly line of amputees there. Mm -hmm. And if you, were, if you were lucky, you didn't get gangrene and you didn't die. So a lot of these wounds uh, were just from the poor medicine, too. That's the picture. That's really to bring it home to people. And then after four long years, the, the light at the end of the tunnel was starting to emerge here. And uh, it really started with Petersburg. Just to give you an idea, Petersburg is a city or town that's just outside of Richmond. And it was the only thing in between Richmond, the capital of the Confederates, and the Union Army. And for nine months, the Union Army laid siege to Petersburg. And they started using a new form of warfare, trench warfare. Anybody know what war this would really uh, come into war. being with? World, World, World War, War I. I. This yeah. is when it was first used. And it was successful, I guess, because finally Petersburg fell on the morning of April 3rd 
word got back to Richmond, the city was evacuated because they knew the road was open, the Union Army would be in their midst within hours. What they did, the Confederate government pulled out, they left, and they lit the place on fire. And I can remember as a kid looking at pictures of Richmond. Um, I'm, I'm about 50 years old, and uh, do you remember in the 70s, the World at War series? Mm -hmm. I was enthralled with that. I remember looking at the bombing of Dresden and all that. And I, I saw that, I thought, boy, that looks like something out of World War II. Mm -hmm. Look at the wreckage. This is the United States. And for me, I, I thought, that thing, that kind of thing doesn't happen here. Mm -hmm. It did. And this is what Richmond looked like. <coughs> now, Abraham Lincoln visited Richmond just days after it fell. And I, I say he kind of did a little bit of a victory lap. He came into Richmond, and people, <coughs> especially the slaves, were falling at his feet, kissing his hands, kneeling, and he would pull them up and say, you don't kneel to anybody except for God. And if you look at this picture here, it shows you also he had a real disregard for his own safety. How many, he didn't have a few soldiers there. And he's got his little boy with him in the middle of the Confederate capital. Did he think that the Confederates, all of them left? I'm sure if there was a sniper up in that window, he could have gotten Lincoln right then. And his son. So he went in there just to show people that the war is coming to an end. And as I say, he took kind of a victory lap. He went to the Confederate White House, sat in President Jefferson Davis's desk, and put his boots up on his desk. Right there. He's lucky he didn't get shot. Hmm. Now, the war was coming to an end, but Robert E. Lee's army was still out there, the Army of Northern Virginia, still ranging about... Lee was hoping that he could smash through and hook up with General Johnston in the West and form two armies together and hopefully continue the fight. He went west with his army and he ran into a wall of blue, nothing but Union. He knew that was it. He wasn't ready to commit suicide. He didn't want to kill all of his men because it, he knew it was hopeless. So he sent a letter to General Grant and sued for peace. Grant sent a letter back and said, where do you want to do it? And Lee said, I want to do it here, Appomattox Courthouse, in the home of Wilmer McLean. Now, Wilmer McLean had just moved here. He used to live in a place called Manassas, uh, also known as Bull Run, where the war started. The first battle of the Civil War started in Manassas and ended in Appomattox Courthouse. So you could literally say the war started in his front yard and ended in his parlor with the surrender of General Lee. And General Lee, that morning, rode up on his brilliant steed, traveler, brilliant white horse, and got off of it and entered. And he probably looked a lot like that. General Lee was the general. In the beginning of the war, Lincoln wanted him to lead the Union. And he turned it down. He said his allegiance was with his home, Virginia. And he went with Virginia. And he was proper, prim, and you could see not a, not a speck on that uniform in the middle of the war. Probably had his sash on and walked in. All eyes were on Lee. And he got in there, and just a few minutes afterwards, this man came in. Yeah. Yeah. Covered in mud, wearing a, a private's blouse. Uh, that was Ulysses S. Grant, covered in mud. And, you know... He didn't look like much, but Grant was a bulldog. Grant won this war. And Lincoln was looking for Grant. He went through, I don't know how many generals looking for Grant. And, you know, he started winning battle after battle after battle, but at high costs. And a lot of the other generals were jealous. And some of them would approach Lincoln and say, well, you know, that Grant, he's a big drunk. Yeah. And you know what Lincoln would say? He would say, well, find out what kind of whiskey he drinks <laughs> and buy it for all my generals. Yeah. That was Ulysses S. Grant. But in the presence of Robert E. Lee, I think even he, he was starstruck too because he knew Lee. He knew Lee as the greatest general, even though he lost Gettysburg. Uh, and he came in and they had a little, 
Grant was actually nervous. Here is this guy surrendering to Grant, and he's trying to make small talk. And he said to Lee, he said, do you remember when you, when you met me uh, during the Mexican-American War? And, and I can just imagine Lee kind of looking down his nose and going, no, I don't think so. Not, not in that Boston accent, but. <laughs> <laughs> but eventually they sat down, and uh, his nickname didn't apply here. U.S. Grant was known as Unconditional Surrender Grant. You surrendered and you gave up everything to Grant. He was, like I said, he was this bulldog. But in this case, he wasn't unconditional surrender. He was able to agree to conditions. Lee uh, signed a, a surrender in which his officers were able to keep their sidearms. The men uh, and uh, all the other men would pile up all their muskets in their cannon and leave it there. Anything that was government or uh, Confederate issue, they left. Uh, the generals would and the officers sign their own paroles. That meant as long as you swore allegiance to the United States, you could go home. And uh, the corps commanders signed off for their men, and they could go home. And that was effectively the end of the war. There were still bands of guerrilla fighters out there, but this was really it. Now, and if, if you know your history, a uh, fellow by the name of Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain had his men snap to attention and salute the Confederates. Got in trouble for it, too. So, let's go back a couple months here. Uh, this is about the plot to kidnap Lincoln. A few months before, there was a plot to kidnap Lincoln, and, and the idea was to kidnap Abraham Lincoln, throw him in a carriage, bring him into the heart of the Confederacy, and hold him ransom. The ransom would be to release all the Confederate prisoners, and then we can start the war all over again. Hmm, very good plan. And here is the leader. I don't know, maybe you recognize him. Yes. Do you believe he, he was 27 years old? Um, from the famous Booth acting family? He didn't start acting until he was 20. Uh, he went to St. Timothy's Military Academy. Uh, while there, in his latter years, he was actually a witness to the execution of the abolitionist John Brown. See the hand of fate moving there? Uh, he smuggled, and during the war he smuggled quinine to troops. And during 1863 he was arrested for making treasonous remarks against the government. Lincoln shut down free speech back then. It was a time of war. Now, what a lot of people don't know is that he became the most famous actor in the United States. Uh, in his in his plays, he had this athletic ability, and he was kind of like a you know a Civil War type Errol Flynn, where he'd come in swinging on ropes with the sword fights and everything. And even Lincoln himself had seen Booth. Um, it's it's said that uh, during a play, Booth yelled some violent words that were his lines and turned towards Lincoln, and Lincoln leaned over to Mary and said, I don't think that fellow likes me. <laughs> uh, everybody in the United States had these albums that contained what they call carte de visites. And these things were basically uh, postcards with famous people on them. John Wilkes Booth was probably in most houses in the United States. He was a well-known face. And he was the leader of this plot to kidnap Lincoln. Now, he brought in some of his friends. This is Michael O'Loughlin, who was 25 years old. He grew up down the street from uh, John Wilkes Booth. And during the Civil War, he joined up the, with the Confederates. And uh, midway through the war, he had to cash out because of health reasons. Uh, around 1892, he returned to Baltimore and uh, took a job as a clerk at his brother's feed business. So when John Wilkes Booth came and said, you want to be in, an, in a kidnap plot, he saw adventure and jumped on it. A lot better than working as a clerk in your brother's feet. This is Samuel Arnold, 31. Uh, he met Booth uh, while he was a student at St. Timothy's Hall Military Academy. <coughs> and um, he also joined the Confederate Army in the beginning of the war. And for the same thing, he cashed out around 1864 and returned to Baltimore shortly before the kidnap plot 
and he was unemployed, so he, he was somebody that jumped at this too. So he, the first people he bring, brings into this plot are people that he knows, that he trusts. And then Booth makes this trip to Montreal in uh, the fall of 1864, October. And Montreal was known as the uh, Little Richmond. It was a hotbed of Confederate spies. In fact, there was actually an invasion plot that was plotted up here. It was kind of a foil plot that came in through, I believe, Vermont. Uh, there were many spies. There were undercover, uh, underground people. And Booth met with some of these people, most notably at George Sanders and Patrick Martin. It's not really known what they talked about, but it is known that he, uh, Booth returned with a, a good sum of money and some letters of introduction. One letter of introduction to, was to this man. This is Dr. Samuel Mudd, who lived in Maryland. Now, Maryland was a free state, but it had quite a Confederate underground. And he had the connections, he knew all the underground people, and he introduced Booth to some of them. John Surratt was another Confederate <coughs> underground operative here. A young guy, he was uh, in his early 20s, I believe he was 21. Uh, his mother owned the Surratt Tavern, which had a post office, and it was a perfect crossroads for dropping off messages. He transported messages back and forth. He had all the connections with the Confederate network out there. And uh, a little bit about him. Before the war, he wanted to become a Catholic priest. And then the war came along and he decided to become a secret agent. So I guess yeah, war can really change people. His mother, although I wouldn't say she was part of the conspiracy, she uh, provided the locations where these conspirators met. She was 42 years old, widow. She had inherited uh, the Surratt Tavern that was out in Surrattsville, Maryland. Now it's Clinton, Maryland. And uh, also had a boarding house in Washington, D.C. on H Street. And this is uh, where the conspirators met. And there's been a lot of debate as to how much she actually knew. Through John Surratt, there were several other people that Booth was introduced to. This is George Surratt. He's a 30-year-old German immigrant, and he was brought in because basically he was a backwoodsman. He knew the, the paths and the rivers, and he knew how to get people through, in and out of the woods, and uh, was somewhat of a guide. Now, not only uh, Atrazot, this Davy Harold, who was a young guy too, he was 23, uh, a clerk at the Navy Yard, was also brought in for his knowledge of uh, Virginia and Maryland, the backwoods, because once they grabbed Lincoln, they weren't going to go on the main roads. They had to go through the back country, and you needed these fellows to do that. Now, when you think of Abraham Lincoln, does anyone know how tall he was? Six, six, six foot four. four. You're going to need a big man yeah. to pull him into a wagon. And this is that man. This is. Lewis Powell. He started out as Lewis Powell, eventually changed his name to Lewis Payne, kind of ironic. Uh, he was 21 years old at this time, but he had lived quite a life up until this point. He joined the Confederate Army in 1861 out of Florida. He ended up uh, fighting with the Confederates at the Battle of Gettysburg. He was taken prisoner, and then he escaped. Um, after that, he joined Mosby's Rangers, and if you know anything mm -hmm. about the the Confederate Army. Mosby's Rangers were like these gallant uh, guerrilla fighters that would just come and go like ghosts. The Grey Ghosts. The Grey Ghosts. Yeah, that's what they called them. And uh, they were just uh, renowned throughout the war. He was part of that, too. And just for some reason, he decided that he was just going to uh, <coughs> leave. And he took an oath of allegiance. And uh, shortly after that, he met John Wilkes Booth and became part of this plot to kidnap. He was going to be the muscle, <coughs> Louis Payne. Now, they knew that Lincoln traveled with little or no security, as you can see by this lithograph here. I, I don't see anybody really guarding Lincoln. So their plot was to intercept him on, on a country road while he was going someplace, grab him up, throw him into a wagon, and then spirit him off probably into Alabama or something <coughs> like that. Uh, they just needed the opportunity, so they basically watched Lincoln, they watched his movements. They knew that he would go out to the old soldier's home from time to time. 
But then the opportunity came. John Wilkes Booth, through his, uh, I guess, thespian connections, uh, found out about this. Actor friends of John Wilkes Booth were putting on a play at the Campbell Hospital. And this is uh, probably November or so. And uh, what they did was uh, they, they told him that Lincoln was going to be in attendance at this play. So everything kicked into high gear. All of them were out there. They were ready for him to make that carriage ride. And it was just out on the outskirts of Washington. Probably maybe he'd have one or two guards. They'd knock the guards out, throw them in the wagon, and boom. Well, they were on the road. And they actually almost jumped another wagon. But uh, no Lincoln. Booth started to get antsy, so he rode out. And he found out that Lincoln had actually ca canceled that day. And here's another twist of fate. If John Wilkes Booth had just stayed home, this is where he was staying, the National Hotel, he would have ran right into Abraham Lincoln because that's where Lincoln went instead of going to the play, to John Wilkes Booth's hotel. So he missed him. And by this time, time went on, uh, Richmond Falls, Appomattox happens, and Booth was utterly destroyed. He thought all hope was gone and was, uh, I think he spent several days just drunk. And then Lincoln made a speech from the balcony of the White House. And this is just a little snippet from that speech. <coughs> in that speech he was talking about uh, bringing the Confederacy back in, malice towards none, charity for all, but it, he also mentioned something else here. The elective franchise, that, that means let's give the vote to the freed slaves. <clears throat> we already freed them. This was a step before. And there were two men in the audience that heard that. John Wilkes Booth and Lewis Payne. And at this point, it said that Booth leaned over to Payne and said, that's the last speech he'll ever give. And this plot, I believe, in, at least in Booth's mind, turned from a plot to kidnap to a plot to murder President Lincoln. There was a meeting of the conspirators held. O'Loughlin and Arnold didn't want anything to do with it. Dr. Mudd didn't want anything to do with it. John Surratt didn't want anything to do with it. So you were just left with Atrazot, Harold, and Payne Powell here. So they, again, they needed the opportunity. When's this opportunity going to come to get Lincoln? And it didn't take long. <clears throat> it happened on this day. And it all happened within one day. What I'm going to do is trace Lincoln's movements, and then I'm going to trace Booth's movements, and you'll see how it all comes together. That morning, Lincoln had his cabinet meeting, and if you know anything about his cabinet, he, he didn't have yes men on his cabinet. He had people that were diametrically opposed to him in many ways. And he was trying to argue uh, the case that the South should be brought back immediately, that they shouldn't be punished. And there were other people on his cabinet that felt that the members of the South, including Lee, were traitors, that they should be hanged from the nearest tree. And he, he preached that we should bring them back and, and try to bring the Union together doing what they wanted to do and just divide people more. And as he was arguing that, Ulysses S. Grant came in and told him, well, Abram, uh, I'm sorry, but the, the invitation that you extended to me to see a, a, a movie, a play at Ford's Theater today, I have to decline because we have to go to New York. Now, some historians say the true story was that his wife, Julia, didn't want anything to do with Mary Lincoln. Mary Lincoln was a highly jealous woman. And there were many times where there were generals' wives or politicians' wives that might you know, say something to Abraham Lincoln as they were in a group or something, and she would fly off the handle. Julia didn't want anything to do with that, didn't want anything to do with Mary Lincoln. So I think she whispered in Grant's ear, let's make an excuse and bug out of town. And that's what they did. They Eventually they did go to New York. So now uh, Lincoln is left without anybody to go to the play. Eventually he would find a young couple to go with him. Later that afternoon, Mary and Abraham would take a ride in this carriage uh, 
Mary would later recount what the conversation was like. And she said he was happy for a change. After, after four years of nothing but blood and gore and casualties mounting and mounting and mounting, it was like a weight lifted off his chest. He was starting to talk about things like what was he going to do after his presidency. Uh, he talked about going to the Holy Land, going to Egypt, doing all these things. He was looking towards the future. And I'll, although I don't have it right now, I'll, it'll be coming up in a minute. You can almost see this in the last picture that was taken of him. He's got a little shadow of a smile. And I, I invite you someday to just sit down in front of the computer and just look up portraits of Abraham Lincoln. In the middle of the war, oh, he is so disheveled. His eyes are crossed. His hair is messy and everything. Because you can tell the man was being utterly tortured by this war. That last photograph, I think, says it all. He finally has a smile on his face. If you know anything about Lincoln, he went through what they call back then melancholy. Today we call it depression, and from what I've read, it was probably clinically, he was probably clinically depressed at times. So for him to come out of this war was quite a thing. And later that day, they had dinner. His uh, son Robert came back from the front, and uh, they talked about what they were going to do, and uh, they were going to see a play that night. And he had been able to find a young couple to go with him, a major Rathbun and his uh, fiance Clara. So that, that's what the Lincolns were up to. What was John Wilkes Booth up to during the same period? Well, he woke up, and it said some witnesses said that he was he was breakfasting with three beautiful women at the National Hotel that morning. And I, I don't know, I kind of look at John Wilkes Booth as kind of like the George Clooney of the day. I mean, <laughs> and when they found his diary, they had five, he had five pictures of different women. Uh, he was engaged to a senator's daughter, so he was, I guess, what you call a player now. Um, it, as evidenced, uh, that morning he had breakfast with three beautiful women. And as he did every morning, he would go down to Ford's Theater. This was his home away from home. He picked up his mail here. He was familiar. He acted here many a time. And this is when he found out that Abraham Lincoln and Ulysses S. Grant were going to be seeing a play. And he kicked in the high gear. This was the perfect place for him. It's his home turf. He knew the play exactly. He even knew when he wanted to strike. And he set the works in motion. And Ford's Theater is still there today. You can visit it. So we went over to the Surratt Borden House. Mary Surratt was there. And he arranged to have packages transported out to the countryside to the Surratt <coughs> Tavern. In fact, uh, he wanted field glasses to be sent out there. And also Mary Surratt would send word that they had these, this was part of the kidnap plot. They had shooting irons out there from when they captured uh, Lincoln. They were actually being hid in between the walls. And she sent word to have those shooting irons ready. Basically it was two carbine rifles. Now, that house is still there today. It's on 8th Street. And if you go there today, you could probably have a nice Chinese food dinner. <laughs> Chinese restaurant. But it's still there. Someday, um, maybe it'll be a museum. Who knows? And then he went over the Kirkwood House and left somewhat of a cryptic message. The Vice President of the United States, Andrew Johnson, was staying there and left a message in his mailbox. Um, I'm not sure. The wording, pretty much the wording was, stop by to see you. You saw that you weren't and didn't mean to bother you. Um, some historians say that it might have been actually left for Johnson's secretary because Booth was a personal uh, acquaintance of that person. But Booth did know also that George Atrazat was two floors below in the same hotel, staying in that same hotel. And that would come into play later on. And then what he did was he wrote out exactly what he was going to do, why he was going to do it. Booth saw himself as the hero of the South. He saw himself as the modern day Brutus. And he wrote a letter and he gave it to a friend of his that worked on the National Intelligentsia in a sealed envelope and said, tomorrow I want you to open the envelope and then you can print this. Well, he took it, he didn't know what it was, and then after the assassination he opened it up and he was aghast. He, he ripped it into shreds and threw it away. It, it, I think it was like 30 years later he finally disclosed that Booth did that. But John Wilkes Booth was expecting that the, the papers would be covered with his explanation of why he did it. There was nothing. 
Another thing happened, and I know a lot of people don't know this, uh, Ulysses S. Grant was heading to New York, and he was in his carriage with his wife, mm -hmm. and as he was going down the street, he noticed this, this dark man with a dark mustache on this fiery black horse galloping down the street. Now, as the man went by him, he galloped by, and he had this, like, glare, and he just looked at Grant. And then he went down the, the road and doubled back and did it again. Just looked right in his eyes. And, and Grant had no idea who this crazy man was. That was John Wilkes Booth. He was probably thinking, I'll get you later. He didn't know that, Lincoln, uh, that uh, Grant was on his way out of town. So the time came when Booth, right before the play, decided to set the stage. And he went to Ford's Theater. By this time, it's empty. And down to the vestibule, there's a little room in between the box and this door. And what he did was he took an old music stand and broke the top and the bottom off and created somewhat of a buttress. He went into this room here and basically fashioned it so he could jam it between the wall and the door. So after he went in there and shot Lincoln, people could not get in there because it had been buttressed shut. So he's laying the groundwork. He knows exactly what he's going to do. And then he uh, contacts all of the players and their roles are given here. He gets the starring role. He is going to assassinate Abraham Lincoln. The bit players in this theatrical uh, extravaganza we're going to be, Atrazot would kill Vice President Johnson. He had a room just two floors below him. All he had to do was walk up two flights of stairs, knock on the door, and shoot him. And Powell and Harold would assassinate the Secretary of State. So all this was going to happen simultaneously. It was like a well-timed, well-oiled machine. Booth knew how the play went, and he knew there was a specific line in the play where there'd be uproarious laughter, and that was when he was going to strike. By this time, 8 o'clock rolls around, and the Lincolns are late for the play. They pick up Major Rathbun and his fiancée, Clara Harris, <coughs> and they head over to Ford's Theater here. Now, it had been raining that night, and it was kind of a ruddy ride, and they finally got there, they opened the doors, and this is the play that they were going to see. Uh, our American Cousin, and, and Lincoln was actually looking forward to seeing this play because it was, it was about him, kind of. Not really, but he could identify with this. It was about this backcountry Kentucky rube going to England to meet his uh, cousin over in England who was a refined British man. And Lincoln really could identify with that. Even though he was the head of state, he was still at heart that rail splitter. And it starred Laura Keene, <coughs> who is herself a Massachusetts native, and uh, a cast of thousands, no, just a few. <laughs> and it happened here at Ford's Theater. So they arrived, they arrived late, the play stopped, the band struck up, hail to the chief, the Lincolns walked into a standing ovation into their box and got settled. And then the play resumed. This is what that box looked like that day. Notice the bunting here. And people in the audience, before anything happened, said they looked up, they saw the first lady and the president holding hands. They were smiling, they were enjoying the play. And just a little while later, this man was summoned to the back door. This is Edmund Spangler, or Ned Spangler. He was uh, the carpenter for the sets. He made the sets. <clears throat> and also a friend of John Wilkes Booth. <coughs> Booth knocked on the door and he said, Ned, would you hold my horse for me? I, had, I don't think he had any idea what was happening. So Ned said, okay, I'll hold the horse. So <laughs> at this same door, Ned Spangler, who he, he's standing there with this horse, which was kind of a, a sprightly horse, too, from what I've read. And... Uh, he starts thinking, what am I doing? I'm here holding Booth's horse while he's doing God knows what in here. So what he did was he gave the horse to this uh, bit player, this boy whose name was Peanut. And Peanut was given the horse to hold outside. Now, while Peanut was holding Booth's horse, 
this is what Booth was doing. He came in the back door of the theater, which was right about here, went underneath the stage as the play was going on, out into an alley on the side of the theater and down into the Star Saloon next door. Probably all the while looking at his watch because he was timing it. <clears throat> and he, he probably, when he went under the stage, knew where they were in the play and had an idea when that line was going to pop up. While he was in, he spent a few minutes in the star, had a glass of brandy, probably stealing himself for the moment. And then when the time was right, he left the star saloon and walked outside through the front door of the Ford's Theater into the lobby and people, the Ford's were there and they were, hi John, how are you doing? He just passed right through. And then he went up to the, the second floor. This is the schematic of the second floor. Got to the balcony here. Now this is where Lincoln's box was. And Booth would make his way down here to that vestibule where he had left the music stand, the little stick for the music stand. And this is probably what he was seeing when he was walking down there. There was a crowd there, of course. There was no guard at the door. The only person at the door was Lincoln's footman, his valet. And John Wilkes Booth just walked up and pulled out his card. And the valet looked and here, John Wilkes Booth. It's probably like if, if uh, George Clooney said, can I see President Obama? <coughs> sure, go right on in. <clears throat> so they let him in. And he opened that door. And this, this is what it looks like. Lincoln and Mary are sitting watching the play while John Wilkes Booth is hovering in here. Now, he was able to see what was going on through a little hole that was drilled in the, in the door here. There's, uh, some historians claim that he actually drilled it, but uh, others have found that the Ford brothers did that because Lincoln frequently went to plays, and they didn't want to disturb him, and they wanted to be able to just peep in and see if he was okay. Booth knew that. He was a habitude of the theater, and he knew all this. So he watched, waited for that moment in the play. And he saw Lincoln, probably from this point of view, <clears throat> pulled out his Derringer, 45 caliber. It's a pretty big bullet. Yeah. And the line happened. It was, you sockdologizing man trap. Whatever that means. <laughs> People thought that was funny back then, and there was a roar of laughter. Booth walked in, put the the gun to the back of Lincoln's head pulled the trigger. Mm -hmm. The bullet went through under the left ear and lodged behind the right eye. Lincoln just went down right onto the ledge of the box. Now, there, were, there was just this moment of confusion. People didn't know. Some people said they thought it was part of the play. <clears throat> Until Mary started wailing and crying and they saw the smoke billowing over the theater. Major Rathbun was the first to take action. He leapt out of his seat and went after Booth, but he didn't know Booth had this big dagger. And Booth started slashing at Rathbun, tearing his arm up his chest, and before he knew it, he was down. Now, Booth, ever the, the actor, was going to make a grand exit. His plan was to jump up onto the ledge, leap onto the stage, but it was foiled because his spur got caught in the bunting. And he went down, he came down uneven, and he broke his leg on the stage. <coughs> now, you can just think, the, the adrenaline going through him was probably enough. He didn't even feel that way. He just got up, flashed his knife, and yelled, Six Semper Tyrannus! Which is Latin for, thus is always to tyrants. Harkening back to Brutus. Also the motto of the state of Virginia, and he bolted off the stage. And I can just imagine, the audience was probably just dumbstruck, because only one man got up and gave chase. And you can see it, this, this fellow here got up on the stage and chased him out the door. And young Peanut is holding the horse, probably, you know, whistling when looking at the stars. And the next thing he knows, John Wilkes Booth comes piling out of that door, gives him an elbow to the face, he goes down, and then he jumps on his horse and gallops away. In this alley, this is Bishop's Alley out in the back of Ford's there. Looks a lot like it did back then. And he was off in a flash. 
and he eventually came to this bridge. Uh, I believe this is the H Street Bridge. And uh, there was a sentry, and the sentry challenged him. And he said, who goes there? And he said, John Wilkes Booth. And he let him go. He did say that he shouldn't have let people go, but I think the war was over, and I think people were getting lax. And he said, well, just, if you can go over, but you can't come back. And Booth was okay with that. <laughs> By the way, this is what that bridge looks like today. I'm sorry, it's the 11th Street Bridge, not the 8th Street Bridge. A little bit different. And Booth was off. He was into Maryland over the Anaconda River. Now, as this was going on, this happened. The attempted assassination of Secretary of State Seward. Now, it was uh, Powell and Davy Harold. Powell didn't know Washington. Davy Harold knew Washington. So Davy Harold was going to lead Powell out of Washington after he killed Seward. And they knew that the Secretary of State had been in a carriage accident prior to this, a few weeks, and he was laid up in bed. He had a big neck brace on, and he was receiving medicine from a pharmacy. So they cooked up this plan that they would take a box <coughs> saying that it was medicine for the Secretary of State, and then it had to be delivered personally. Well, Powell went up to the door and knocked on the door, and the butler came to the door, and he gave him that same story. And the butler wasn't having anything to do with it. He said, no, nobody goes to see the Secretary of State. I'll bring it to him. And then there was a bit of an argument, and then, and then Powell muscled his way into the vestibule. By this time, Frederick Douglass, the son of the Secretary of State, had heard the commotion upstairs and came down and confronted Powell as he was making his way up the stairs. Powell pulled out a pistol, put it right to his head, pulled the trigger, and it went click. So he switched it around and turned it into a hammer and bludgeoned him on the stairs there. He was able to put Frederick down and made his way to the Secretary of State's bedroom where he was laying in bed and set upon him with this dagger and just began to stab him wildly. By this time, there were other men in the house. They came to the rescue of the Secretary of State. They managed to pull Powell off of him, but Powell broke away. He was a big man. And you can imagine, he broke away, and they were all standing there facing him. And it's almost as if he went, Argh! He went, I'm mad! I'm mad! And they all just stood in fright, and he ran out of the house. Now, as he was saying, I'm mad, I'm mad, it, it must have been so loud, because Davy Harold outside heard this and got scared and ran away. So Lewis Powell came running out of the Seward house, and there's nobody around. So he wandered the streets of, uh, New of um, Washington and uh, eventually was captured. He went back to the Surratt boarding house. Uh, bad timing because she was being interviewed by several federal officers. He was taken into custody. Secretary of State Seward survived. And what saved his life was that neck brace. Because Powell kept stabbing and it kept glancing off the neck brace. But he disfigured his face for life. He did survive. This is the only known photograph that you can really see some of the damage that was done to his face. And he would always pose with the other side. But he survived. And then, George Atrazad. All he had to do was take his pistol, knock on the door, and when the vice president... <laughs> can you imagine this happening today? Joe yeah. Biden coming to the door? I don't think so. Uh, and just shoot him. <clears throat> well, George Atrazad had a little problem with alcohol. He had actually been kicked out of the uh, Surratt boarding house for his drinking. And he thought, maybe I'll have a drink to take the edge off. You know, I have to kill the vice president tonight, so I need to help myself. And one drink turned into two, turned into three, turned into... And then he just decided to forget the whole thing and started wandering around the streets of Washington. He ended up being arrested a few days later. Never even attempted to kill the vice president. But he did leave that room <coughs> full of letters to Booth, all sorts of incriminating evidence that eventually tied him to the crime. So, before the night was out, almost every one of the uh, conspirators was captured, or before a few days were out. John Surratt, actually, when the assassination happened, he was in Albany, New York. 
After the assassination, he boarded a ship in, in Canada and went to Europe. So he was out of the picture. Davy Harold was able to meet up with Booth later. And they uh, would be escape buddies. Now, this is what happened back in Ford's Theater after Booth left this wreckage. Uh, people tried to get into that vestibule, and he did a good job. That buttress held. And people were crying, is there a doctor in the house? And some of the doctors actually climbed up onto the box and went in and then opened up from the inside. And they got um, him down on the floor. Now, the, uh, the people surrounding they're all standing around, and some of the doctors, they, they couldn't see where he was injured, and they felt the back of his head and then there was blood. And they realized that the, the hole was right here. One of the doctors actually inserted a probe and a blood clot let go. And up until that point, Lincoln was not breathing. And then he started to breathe again. Still unconscious, and they had this man on the floor. He's still unconscious, he's breathing. And then the discussion went to, where are we going to bring him? He's definitely mortally injured. He can't die in a theater. Theater, theaters were considered lowbrow. Uh, actors were, con maybe not John Wilkes Booth, but your everyday actor was considered maybe this much above a carnival worker. So they, they were thinking, where are we going to bring him? And somebody said, let's bring him to the White House. No, the streets are too muddy. It's, it's too, uh, too dangerous. He'll die on the way. He'll die in the wagon. And then some uh, brainiac said, let's bring him to the salon next door. <laughs> And I can imagine that I, all they probably went, we just said we don't want him to die in the theater. You want to bring him to a bar? So without any, any place in, in mind, they just put him on a board. And I think they just wanted to get him out of the theater. They brought him out the front door of Ford's Theater, and across the way was this house, which we call the Peterson House today. And there was a young man who was a former veteran. He, he saw what was going on, and he waved them in. And they brought him across the muddy street into the Peterson House which you can still visit today. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> this is where Lincoln was brought. And this is the bed that they had in the Peterson house, but it's not the bed that he died in, <laughs> which I found out years later. Uh, the bed that he died in is actually in Springfield, Illinois. This is the actual bed mm -hmm. in the museum that they have up there, which I visited mm -hmm. a couple of years ago. Uh, and this, you can imagine, six foot four, this was a tiny bed. He didn't fit in the bed. They had to lay him in it diagonally. Mm -hmm. And they stripped him of all his clothing. Uh, they kept probing, sticking things in the hole, hoping to s somehow find the bullet or something. Mm -hmm. And uh, they took all of his personal effects off of him. This is what he was carrying that night. And it, it was found that his, his top hat, his famous top hat, was his file cabinet, because that's what he kept in his hat. Oh, <laughs> a newspaper, probably not the wallet, but he had a $5 Confederate note. All these little knickknacks were found on Lincoln in that hat. This is the hat that he was wearing. Also, these are the gloves that he had on. You can still see the blood stains. Also, when they went through his frock coat, they found that his pockets were filled with these white kid gloves. And the story behind that is ever the woodsman. And every time he was out at some function or something, Mary was always on his case. Put your gloves on. You're a gentleman. Gentlemen wear these gloves. And as soon as she was out of sight, in the pockets. So he had pockets full of these gloves. <laughs> now, as the doctors are working on Lincoln, he's still breathing. Secretary of War Stanton takes control. It's kind of like Alexander Haig after Reagan, if you remember that. He starts interviewing anybody that had anything to do with the case. Everybody from Ford's Theater was brought down to the parlor. And he put all sorts of wires and messages out. Uh, be on the lookout for Booth. They, they had figured out who it was very quickly. And uh, the, the investigation was rolling here. As the night wore on, many figures from all over Washington, D.C. came down to see Abraham Lincoln. And these are different portraits showing that moment. Uh, it, they call it the incredible growing room because at some point there's like half of Washington is in the room with Lincoln here. As you see, Mary, Mary was hysterical. They actually had to remove her and put her in another room. 
And as the night wore on, his breathing became more and more labored. The doctors tried to keep him comfortable. There was blood all over the place. And then as the morning came in, he started to have that death rattle. And the, the, the breaths were very labored, and everybody was hanging on each breath. You know, it was like... Seven twenty-two in the morning, and <coughs> Secretary of War Stanton said he now belongs to the ages. Or some who said he was misquoted that he said angels. Abraham Lincoln was gone, and I want to show you this. This to me is fascinating, because an hour later they took his body, they brought it to the White House. And a photographer who lived upstairs came down and took a picture of that bed an hour after they took Lincoln's body out of there. That's the blood from your hand. Wow. It's amazing. This is that room today. You can see how small it is. It's a small, tiny house. And uh, it, don't go during April, because you have to rush right through it. Go through some other, because April's the big time in Washington. And. This is something, my first time being in this place, I was 15 years old and I remember it like it was yesterday. Because something struck me about being in this, this room. It didn't look like this, the pillows looked like, you know, you want to sit down and take a nap. Back then they had this in the bed. The actual pillow from Lincoln. That is his blood on it. And for me, that, that just sent chills up my back. This is not the man on the penny anymore. This is not the man on Mount Rushmore. This was a man that got murdered, and there's his blood. It really brings it home to you, because we all think of him as this icon. There's the human. And then, this is what happened with John Wilkes Booth. A lot of people think he escaped and got away. Eh. He got killed. The first thing he did he was he met up at a place called Sofer's Hill with Davy Harold. It was all prearranged. This was basically the same thing they were going to do when they kidnapped Lincoln. And then they made their way to the Surratt Tavern, which was just this out, out in the middle of nowhere country crossroads. <coughs> Here's what it looked like back then. Had a tavern, restaurant, <coughs> with um, a post office. And this is what it looks like today. It's a museum. And this is... Uh, a lousy video that I did. I'm not a very good vi videographer. Uh, but you get an idea. It's, it's very well uh, kept, maintained. And uh, Booth and Harold rode up, and uh, Mary Surratt's man, uh, the guy that was taking care of it, I think his name was Langdon, came to the door, and uh, he knew what they wanted. He brought out the field glasses, the carbines, and also, Booth, who was riding a horse with a broken leg, uh, asked for a bottle of whiskey, and he got it. And they didn't spend much time there. Davy Harold did all the talking, and their next destination would be their old friend Dr. Mudd's house, where Booth could get his leg set. Now, just to show you a little bit, this is the interior of, uh, I was able to go there last summer, actually, to the Surratt boarding house. <clears throat> and there's the... the um, post office, and if, if we were to pan over a little bit, you'd see the tavern, and I was amazed to find that back in those days, a meal at the tavern actually cost more than a, a, a room for the night. <laughs> because when you checked in for a room for the night, <clears throat> back then, if somebody else showed up, they could put them in the bed with you. So it wasn't really that pleasurable, I guess. Mm -hmm. yeah. It was just a place to sleep. And here is where they hid those carbines. Uh, they were tied to a rope and slung in between the two... Uh, Walls fixtures there, in between the lathing there. And within a few days, this was out. The whole countryside was crawling with federal troops. Now, Booth arrived at Dr. Mudd's house, and I, really, I seriously think that Dr. Mudd had no idea what was going on. He knew Booth from the kidnap plot, but I think it ended there. Uh, he didn't know anything about the murder. And his house is still there. You can visit it. 
uh, and I believe they have the, the boot that he cut off Booth there as well. He set his leg, and the next day, Dr. Mudd went out and saw that the place was crawling with Union troops, and basically said to Booth, you, you gotta get out of here, because it's too hot. Get out. And Booth and Harold lit out. And as you can see by the map here, they made their way from Dr. Mudd's. They met up with Samuel Cox, who was uh, a biggie in the, in the Confederate underground. <coughs> Samuel Cox hooked them up with a fellow named Thomas Jones, who uh, lived in a house um, called Huckleberry. And this is uh, the marker where Huckleberry is. Now, Huckleberry is actually a private home, so you can't really go there and take a picture of it. And here's old Thomas Jones. His role in all this wasn't made uh, known for years afterwards, too. He was somebody who kept his mouth shut for a long time, too. But he was one of these guys that knew the, the woods, and he had Booth and Harold hide out in what we call the Pine Thicket. And they hid out there for about six days, and he said to Booth, he said, I want your horses, don't light a fire, don't make any noise, just stay here, because they're all over the place. And when I come, I will give you a special whistle. I'll do this, I'll whoosh, and you'll know it's me. And a few days later, he came with newspapers and, and food, and Booth was ready to open that newspaper and see what glory he was in for. And there was nothing but what a coward he was, what a backstabber. He shot him in the back of the head. And Booth was dumbstruck. He was crestfallen because he thought he would be lauded as, as the new Brutus, the, the one that took the tyrant out. But even in the South, he was roundly condemned. And later on, he would write his story in his, his diary that would be con uh, confiscated. And let me, let me read to you from the diary here. This is John Wilkes Booth's own words. I struck boldly, not as the papers say, I walked with firm step through thousands of his friends, what stopped and pushed on. Then later he says, after being hunted like a dog through the swamps, woods, last night being chased by gunboats till I was forced to return wet, cold, and starving with every man's hand against me, I am here in despair. And why? For doing what Brutus was honored for, what made Tell, William Tell, a hero. And yet, for striking down a greater tyrant that they ever knew, I am looked at as a common cutthroat. So he wanted to right the wrong. This is where he stayed. Uh, this is really hard to find. This marker is actually a half a mile away from the actual site where they were hid out in the woods. And I had to do a lot of digging to find this. And I found it's down this old road. And if you were to cross this farmer's cro uh, uh, crops here, this cornfield, out in the woods there, that's where they hid. I didn't have enough gumption in the south to go through somebody's cornfield, though. So I just videotaped it. Yeah. But that's where he was. That's where they hid. And then finally, Thomas Jones had determined that, you know, that he died down a little bit, and he gave them a boat and shoved them into the Potomac and said, good luck. And they got across the Potomac. You can see they got a little lost out here. And eventually they ended up at a place called Lucas Farm, only slept there for a night, and then they ended up here at Garrett's Farm, which is in Port Royal, Virginia. This is what the farm looked at like at the time. It was just a common farmhouse. <clears throat> Booth and Harold arrived, and they knocked on the door, and they claimed that they were just Confederate soldiers returning from the war, and Booth was injured. Could they help some Confederates? And the Garretts obviously had Confederate sympathies, so they allowed them in. But they started to notice something strange. Every time a group of Federals or Union troops would ride by, Booth and Harold would go and like hide behind the barn until they were gone. And they thought that was kind of strange. They thought, no, the war's over. Why are they doing that for? And they started to think that maybe they were highwaymen, that they were wanted or something. This is what the barn looked like later on, or I should say the farm. And by the 1930s, it looked like that. It's a shame it fell down. It's no longer there. And after, after a few nights, uh, the Garretts had a little conversation, the father and the brothers, and they decided to ask the two to go sleep out in the tobacco barn. Because they, they thought maybe they're going to wake up in the middle of the night and rob us and kill us. And this is what a tobacco barn looks like. Uh, mm -hmm. It's purposely got gaps so the air can get in and dry the tobacco. And this is where they slept. And uh, little did they know, the Garrett's actually went out and put a padlock on the door. Because they didn't <laughs> trust them that much. 
That night, the federal troops arrived looking for Booth and Harold, and they said, oh, we know who they are now. Go get them. And they surrounded the barn, and they called for Booth and Harold to give up. And Booth had his carbines. He was ready to shoot it out to go to the end. Davy Harold, on the other end, on the other hand, wasn't so courageous, and he asked to ask Booth if he could be let out. Now, the soldiers weren't going to go toe to toe with Jarmuth's Booth. They decided, let's just light the barn on fire. They did that. They took Davy Harold out. He gave up. They tied him to a tree. And at this time, Booth was staggering around in the burning barn with his his weapon. And one of the soldiers outside claimed that he was starting to level it and aim it towards other federal troops through one of the gaps in the barn. He acted quickly. He took his pistol out and shot Booth, almost in the same location that Lincoln was shot, right behind the left ear. Booth went down. The federal troops came in and dragged him out. This is the man that killed John Wilkes Booth, Boston Corbett. It's often said that he went against orders. There were no orders not to shoot Booth. And this is what it looked like when they dragged him out. Now they dragged him out, brought him over to the porch of the Garrett house. He was still conscious. He was still alive. <laughs> and he lingered all night, although he was paralyzed. At uh, one point, he motioned for the soldiers to lean down to listen to what he was going to say. And they leaned down, and he said, Tell, tell my mother I, I died for my country. <laughs> and then the, I think he realized that he couldn't feel his hands, and he, he, he asked for them to hold his hands up, and then they let him go, and he just went like that. And he exclaimed, useless, useless. Those were the only words he said. He survived until the morning. Just It said, just as the sun was coming over the pine trees, Booth breathed his last breath. Now, that site is still in existence, but it's in the middle of a highway median <laughs> where the Garrett farm was. And the location of that porch is marked with a metal pipe. Now, this is that location. If you can see, there's, there's a little sign that says, no relic hunting, as if he left his, his pocket watch there or something. Like a booth coin. <coughs> but if you look down, in, um, you can see that there's a metal pipe here. That marks where that porch was. And some, some group put this here, the Confederate Legion. Kind of shady. And you can see it's in the middle of a highway. It's kind of a shame. But I think uh, people at that time looked at this as a black mark and just let it fall apart. And this was found. This is his diary. And uh, it was confiscated and didn't really uh, emerge for years later. And uh, 14 pages were ripped out of it. And people often try to guess what was in those 14 missing pages. And he was brought to Washington, uh, put aboard an ironclad. There was an autopsy conducted. And uh, I know there's been many <coughs> theories about that Booth got away and he ended up out in the West. And somebody, some man, John St. Helen, claimed to be John Wilkes Booth and they mummified his body. <laughs> Davy Harold never said, you know, during his whole trial, he never said, that's not Booth. You know? He did, when they took him out of the barn, he said, that's not Booth in there. But, of course... He wouldn't say that. Right? So, the conspirators were all rounded up. They were brought in for trial. John Surratt was still at large, though. And this is where they brought the old Arsenal building. This is what it looked like. The trial was held in here. And this is what the courtroom looked like. All the defendants were placed in a row up here. And as you see, it's a military tribunal. It was not a <coughs> civil hearing or a civil court case. These were the judges. It was quick. The defense lawyers were given the opportunity to give the case of the different defendants, and that was about it. And the judgments were swift and quick. And just to show you the, the tenor of the times, the country was out for blood. They wanted their heads. And these people were made to sit like this in their cells when they were not in the courtroom. The only time 
they were able to take these hoods off or, or when they were in the courtroom <laughs> and with a guard on them. Each and every one of them. <clears throat> Those hoods are still in existence today. I believe they're at the Smithsonian in Washington. And they were shackled, too. And then when they were brought out for trial, that was the only time that they could breathe free, so to say. Well, as I said, the justice was swift, if you can call it that. Uh, and the sentencing came down rather quickly. These were the sentences. David Harold, for his role in both the kidnap and assassination plot, was given death by hanging. George Atrazot, death by hanging. Mary Surratt, death by hanging. First woman to be executed by the uh, federal government. And Louis Payne, Louis Powell, death by hanging. Now, uh, Dr. Mudd, for his role, was given life imprisonment. He would later be freed because there was a yellow fever epidemic in the dry Tortugas where they were kept down in Florida. And he saved a lot of lives, so he was let go. And um, one of the men that died in that was uh, Michael O'Loughlin, who got a life sentence. He died in that yellow fever ep epidemic. Samuel Arnold was in that same yellow fever epidemic, and he survived. Although he was given life imprisonment, he was uh, commuted by President Johnson years later, and he was able to get out. He lived to an old age. Ned Spangler, remember the guy that held the horse? For his trouble, he got six years in jail. And John Surratt, what happened to him? Remember I told you that he wanted to be a Catholic priest? Well, he ended up... Uh, in the Vatican as one of the Swiss, Swiss guards. They, they captured him in the Vatican. Two years later, brought him back. He was put on trial in front of a, a, a civil court, a civilian court. And uh, they had a couple hung juries, and they just gave up. And he just went off scot-free. Uh, he decided that it would be a good idea to go on the lecture circuit after that. He was well-received in the South, but when he tried to do his lecture in the North, he was nearly lynched. And he lived to a rifle. Too. That's John Surratt. Uh -huh. So, those four that were condemned to death were to be executed the same day. <clears throat> right after the trial, no appeals. <laughs> and as they, as they were tried, and they were sitting in their jail cells, they were constructing the scaffolding right outside of their jail cells. And this was the scene. Simple scaffolding. You knock these out and, the, and it drops. Four people executed simultaneously. Here is George Atrazot with his minister getting some religious counseling. Uh, Davy Harold had, I think, six sisters, and they were all there weeping at his side. Mary Surratt had her priest giving the blessing, the last rites. And poor Lewis Powell, Lewis Payne, nobody ever came to visit him. His family was in Florida, maybe they couldn't make it. And then the day came, it was a hot July afternoon in Winfield Scott Hancock, the hero of Gettysburg, was the one that was going to be in charge here. They lined everybody up and it's amazing for the photography of the time, you've seen all those blurry 19th century pictures. Many of these pictures are extremely clear if you look at these. Even though there's some blurred figures, you can make out Atrazot here. This is Lewis Payne. Atrazot. Here's Davy Harold and Atrazot. They're putting the hoods on. They're in stocking feet. Look at the terror on his face. He knows he's going to be making, meeting his maker. And if you look here, you can almost make out the face of uh, Mary Surratt. She's, she's almost in a uh, fainting spell. What the priest is holding up there is a cross. She's probably kissing that cross right there. And uh, the camera wasn't able to capture the face of Lewis. He was Powell, but uh, another photographer did get this, so you get kind of an idea there. That's a lot more green. And here's how the newspapers depicted it. They were all lined up. They were bound hand and foot. Hoods were placed over their heads, and then the nooses. <clears throat> As they were put up here, uh, Mary Surratt, right before they dropped the platform, said, please don't kill me. 
And Louis Payne the whole time was saying, she's not involved, let her go, let her go. Extremely clear photographs of this. Yeah. It said that her daughter actually begged Anthony Johnson for clemency and he refused. Mm. And here's what the soldiers did. They just pushed those supporting beams out there <clears throat> and they dropped all four. Three necks snapped. Lewis Powell, Lewis Payne, he, he was such a muscular guy that he had, uh, his neck did not snap. He strangled to death for seven minutes. He also started to try to swing back and forth to knock out this. The whole thing would have come down if he did it. And strangled to death there. And as you can see, the graves were right under the gallows. And they hung there for probably, uh, I think, about a half hour, just to make sure that everything was good. the coffins ready for burial. And thus brings the end to one of America's most horrible nightmares. <clears throat> and thank you for coming tonight. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know if, it, if there's any questions. Yes. Was there any effort to get any information out of them once they were convicted or were they just Um Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure there was. And they did give up information, like David Harrell <laughs> did say that that was John Wilkes Booth. That's why I always go back and say that he, he didn't become a mummy, he didn't escape. But I think Harold would have said it was somebody else. <clears throat> um, they, they knew that uh, John Surratt was on the loose, but they didn't know where he was. Um, Mary never gave him up. And I always have this feeling that she was kind of held as kind of bait to lure him back. And he, never, he knew what she was condemned, and he never came back. Uh, he was captured eventually. So. Okay. Oh, one more. Um, I was always like devastated that only one um, guard was watching him who was out supposedly. Having right. Oh. Mm -hmm. Was this was Stanton, did, did the Secretary of Defense responsible for the election? <coughs> um, Secret Service. You know who? I, I well, I do know that he was never punished. Uh, Forty years later, supposedly. He, he got, yeah, and he, he was known flat. for drinking and right. falling asleep on the job, and eventually that's what he did again, and he got fired years yeah. later. But it was like twenty, they, like you said, twenty years later. Right. They still was. don't know where he was. Uh, some say he was in the audience. Some say he was in the bar next door. He wasn't on his post, and he was never fired. Can you imagine the, the Secret yeah. Service uh, today? Well, that's why I, mean, I said so. I was always like, even back then they were. Who was responsible for Lincoln's protection? Right, that one guard. Hit, but Lincoln no, was advised to have more people. What department did that fall under? Um, at that time, I'm not sure it was the Secret Service yet. Okay, I was just curious. Off the top of my head, maybe somebody else knows. I think it was more military. Um, okay. I was, you know, like, yeah. like curious, like, yeah, fine. Who's, yeah. Yeah. eventually, whose wrist got slapped in there for that, you know? It, yeah, it was. It, 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 yeah, because it, it was going to be an assassination attempt when he was inaugurated. He told them to sneak into Washington and cover by a few guitars. Thank you. Thank you.